Firstly, I would like to say welcome everyone and acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands that we meet on here today. I come to you on the, from the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present um, and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also like to acknowledge our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander First Nation colleagues who are in the room today. Thank you everyone for joining us um, for the Dance and Physical Theatre webinar. Today's going to be quite conversational, but it's really designed to answer any grant writing questions that you may have whilst also providing an opportunity for you to directly ask questions of our incredible art form advisory board members, Alice um, Cadwell and Carolyn Spence, and also to learn from how other organisations and or individuals may do it. So we have Cecily Hardy from Legs on the Wall here as well. And it is that opportunity to kind of really get an insight. So please use it, ask as many questions as you want. Um, we're happy to uh, address them and facilitate this um, in the best way possible that will work for all of you as potential applicants. Um, in terms of starting, it's really important when we think about grant writing that we do understand it is a skill. Um, and it's one that many of us who sit on all sides of the fence have had to hone in over time, um, I think throughout the careers. But one of the purposes of today as well is this idea that if you start writing at least one grant for your project or program, then you're able to look at how you can repurpose that for other funding bodies that you may go to. Um, so it's about not having to duplicate your efforts, but really being able to build on a strong, producing a really strong foundation. Next slide, please, Shane. I'd also like to acknowledge that I have uh, the incredible Create New South Wales colleagues in the room today. I have Shane Grace, uh, Tammy Close, Sarah Rose and Nick Santoro, I think, and they'll also be putting in... Um, links and everything in the chat box. So you've got a really quick, easy access. Um, currently, Create New South Wales offers a range of grants. We have project grants, which aim to support one-off projects. Um, this can be as a development or as a presentation grant and are available for organizations and individuals. We also have program grants, which are annual funding for organisations to deliver a 12-month program. We also then offer small project grants of up to $5,000 for individual artists, and this is on a rolling basis um, where they're assessed every three weeks. At the end of this year in November, we'll also be having the Local Government Authorities Grant, and then from... September round one we'll have regional arts touring and then there'll be a second round in 2022 of regional arts touring and then we have also the creative leadership which is about supporting artists and practitioners at different stages of their careers to take up um, new professional development opportunities and you'll see in the chat um, Nick's also put the guidelines up. Thanks, Shane. So these are our three incredible speakers today. These are a little bit of our bio, their bios. Um, Alice is the general manager and creative producer of Spaghetti Circus and also sits on our dance and physical theatre art form board. Um, Carolyn is the chief commercial officer and former director of education outreach at Sydney Dance Company, also our art form board member. And Cecily Hardy is a senior creative producer at Legs on the Wall. Um, and Legs was successful last round in receiving funding for their application. So this was really about um, also providing concrete and real-time examples of successful applicants. So because dance and physical theatre um, covers a whole lot of art forms, we thought it would be good to actually start with a really brief and succinct discussion of 
the different areas that this encompasses. So I might start with Alice and talking about um, what physical theatre encompasses and the definition of that. Awesome. Thanks, Brianna. So um, the breadth of experience on the dance and physical theatre board is really broad. So it's really worth thinking that the assessors aren't just from your art forms. So um, circus and physical theatre is included. So there may be practitioners um, and assessors who haven't seen your work before. Um, so we really encourage a range of applications from the dance and physical theatre. Um, and in terms of circus, um, we really understand that there's a range of devised works, small to medium companies. There's a whole lot of people out there who we encourage applications from. And we also really acknowledge as a board that there's a lot of um, New South Wales practitioners that have often moved to other states. So there's a whole range of people in the room, but yeah, we really encourage those applications. And thanks, Alice. And Carolyn, yeah. for you, what's contemporary dance encompass and what do you, um, how do you define it? Thanks, Brianna. And thanks, Alice. I think that's it's so true um we see such diversity in this sector and you know contemporary dance is is um also exceptionally diverse and we see that reflected in terms of everything from um commissioning new works um it could be from the independent sector or small to medium it crosses circus festivals physical theater dance education and training um we look um at applications from dancers, choreographers, Indigenous artists, um, and the board is very reflective of that diversity as well. Um, in terms of contemporary dance, we see lots of applications around developments, presentations, residencies, advocacy bodies, um, a whole range of different ones. I'm happy to answer any specific questions that there any, anyone's not sure if their application fits into the um, dance and physical theatre art form board. And maybe, Sess, I'll ask you the same question as a producer from Legs and also the history of Big Heart is, um, how would you define Legs's work in terms of an art form as well? You're on mute, my darling. It's so interesting for us because we often slip outside of boards depending on how they are defined through time because we physical theatre sometimes sits in such an in-between space. Like often we are, we will say that we kind of sit in that the meeting point between theatre, dance, circus, sport and street. Um, but I suppose we've kind of honed it down to two key thoughts for us personally at Legs in terms of physical theatre and that's that one, that there's a physical practice or a physical language that's at central, like really at the core of the work. It doesn't have to be the solo art form, but it has to be so integral to the work. Um, and also that number two, I suppose, is that we're taking the audience on a journey, that there is a sense of story. And for us equally, and for many of you, I'm sure, and I know many of you, it's true that it doesn't mean a linear narrative. It doesn't even necessarily mean a scripted or a text-based work. It can be non-verbal. But um, yeah, I suppose the the one thing that we say when people ask us why does legs stick with physical theatre, our kind of one-liner has become when words are not enough or when words alone are not enough. I love that. That's a beautiful thing. And that's and I think in terms of those looking at putting applications in, particularly around um, device process and where, where it may look in, as interdisciplinary, that's a really nice question to ask. In terms of grant applications, for you, Alice, what does a successful application look like? I really want to see a spark as an assessor. So we're um, seeing so many applications and we're reading, you know, just like you're, you know, writing so many pages. So I also really acknowledge just how hard people are in the final few days of this application process. Um, I want to see the spark and I want to see your voice. I don't necessarily want to see um, a sterilised um, version that's got, been written for a grant. I really want to see your voice as an artist and supported by your support material um, and also just that basic stuff. I really want to know it's eligible, it meets the criteria. You know, as assessors, we're really looking at that merit and impact question all the time. 
Um, and yeah, it's a challenging process to read it all. So yeah, your unique voice is really important for me. And Carolyn, what inspires you when you read an application? Um, that's such a good question. I think for me, as Alice said, it's seeing that voice, it's seeing how the application, how the project or the organisation contributes to those key priority areas that Create New South Wales defines around enhancing creative leadership or programming excellence, um, whether it's about growing New South Wales art and cultural activity, um, and strengthening arts in our sector. So I'm really looking at, um, and I'm inspired by things that sort of talk about the current situation and how this project or this organization will develop or change um, that situation. And I guess when you're thinking about successful applications, it would be really great, Cecily, to actually talk through the process that LEGS went through um, to be able to get their grant through in the last round and the feedback that they received. So do you want to take us through that process of how you wrote a successful application? Yeah, sure. Because I mean, you know, it's important to say that we've all had failures and we continue to. So there isn't a magic answer, but there's a whole lot of helpful um, hints and things that w that have worked for us and we thought this current as you said Brianna like this current example is a really good one to talk about because we actually applied for exactly the same activity and exactly the same project in the round before and were unsuccessful um, and so we thought maybe that's a really good example to show that it can be the same work and it's just about looking at how you've articulated it um, and the project that we've recently received funding for is Lazy Susan, which is a new work going into creative development. And it's been created with three regional partners, which will end up being a physical theatre site specific experience that takes over a local Chinese restaurant and the audience takes over the local Chinese restaurant and locals are included as part of the show. Um, and it's pretty wild, <laughs> it's a pretty wild idea, but um, Importantly, it's being led by artists who have Chinese heritage um, or Australian Asian heritage and and as well there's a couple of artists who have actually got personal lived experience of growing up kind of on the floor of um, a Chinese restaurant. So we put bucket loads of effort into our first application and we really did you know do our best to address the key criteria which as you all know, sometimes feels like there's limited space to get it all in. But um, so yes, it was and can be really disheartening or demoralizing to um, get a knock back. But um, we thought maybe there's some general helpful thoughts and then there's a few specific examples of adjustments that I made um, that then went into our second version of that application to be successful. Um, I think a really big one that maybe seems obvious um, in a way but is really good to keep in mind is that you don't take it personally. So if you get the knot back, try to kind of put the emotional response and the disappointment of that to the side um, and look as much as you can with an outside eye or an objective eye because it actually is really bloody useful. Um, and an unsuccessful application does not actually mean that the project is unsuccessful or weak. And um, sometimes you can forget that when you have your confidence knocked. Um, what else? Fundamentally, I think that it, that shows you it's about having faith in the project that you want to undertake. And, and for that reason, you don't take no for an answer. So often I, we find that despite getting the knockbacks at, at times, that it actually has made the project stronger to have that time for extra refinement. Um, and if it's a project that you feel like is worth fighting for and you want to come back again with, then that kind of shows you that it's got depth and value um, and that it's just about finding a way to articulate that. So it does move the assessors, as Alice and Carolyn said, when they're reading, you know, tens of thousands of applications. Um, I also think one that I asked Brianna that she wouldn't kill me because you do have to be not afraid to ask for as much direct relevant feedback as you can and push as hard as is possible without annoying the 
the hell out of all of the stuff because that makes the difference. It allows you to address the specific weaknesses, which can be quite small in your application and allows you to address that and shift it so that it is more holistic and actually the assessors have more fun or more interest reading about that project in a better way the next time around. Um, and look, you cannot get away with not addressing the merit, the impact and the viability of a project. It is literally the fundamental three things and there's no escaping it. And um, if you are not sure if your application's reading strong on those, my very simple advice is you have to be brave and bold to go back, plug more information in or refine your answers or edit it or change it because ultimately if you think, um, if you just hope for the best kind of knowing in your gut that they needed some more clarity, then you're probably right, they probably did need more clarity. So. Yeah, be, be bold enough to kind of keep them as refined and clean as possible. Um, and then I suppose there's a couple of examples really specifically for that project, for the difference between application one and application two. Um, so I did, we did look at it with a fresh eye. We did get feedback from Create staff and really try and digest that and listen to it. Um, and got over the rejection and, you know, how much effort we felt we'd put in the first time. But, um, yeah, and I think from my perspective, an important point to make, which often actually doesn't kind of get made, is that it's okay, you don't have to apologise for being the producer or being the facilitator. Like, I'm a creative producer. I have social change and community producing background. That's where I come from. I have... I, it's okay for me to be the vibrant voice of the application or the one writing it, but in saying that, I have to be very aware of letting the key artist's voice speak in the application and have a legitimate space. Um, and that's also hugely true if you have community, you know, mentioned or engaged in your application, um, because it has to be real and you can't speak for them. And it is so obvious when you are speaking for them. Um, that probably would be my number one advice and I have to take it, continually take it myself as well. Um, and you really want the project to read as dynamic and inspired but also achievable. So that's a really big thing we found in terms of don't try and do every single thing and have this huge kind of activity that's almost even too difficult to explain in the space you have, that it's okay to have an achievable amount of activity that could even be staged out, um, that can still be vibrant and it can be unashamed about that it's building to further activity or other stages yet to come. Um, and that can be something that you can be bite-sized and achievable. In our second application, we actually reduced our creative development activity locations so that we could focus on a deeper kind of centralised community engagement and maintain our focus for achieving the artistic milestones that we'd mentioned that were so important to the process. And we didn't reduce the budget because actually we legitimately still had individuals undertaking the activity, but we refined it down and simplified um, the, act, the action, you know, and the, the busyness of the project. Um, another important thing that's relevant to those two applications was painting the picture, as Alice said specifically, you know, that she really, you really want to see the soul and the excitement of the project and you don't have to get caught in the bureaucracy of sounding official and, you know, answering kind of dryly because that's really boring um, and these are artistic projects. So, you know, with um, our second app I learnt to out, that it was okay to outline the vision of the show and the audience experience that we intended to create even though that wasn't defined until we were in going to be in the process and I had been a bit afraid of that, you know, um, and sort of shied away from expressing the artistic vibrancy because I didn't want to speak for the artists but um, I think that actually in reflecting on it, it was important um, to be able to show the vision and um, and it, actually it's okay for that to shift and evolve once you're in the development process. 
but for the purpose of the application, you really want to paint the picture. Um, and in our application, I included um, the second time around, we included an audience visual map, um, visual experience map that was created with the lead artists that really outlined the artistic kind of framework or journey of the specific show so that they had a sense of what the audience would actually be you know, experiencing and taking home with them. Um, and I think that did actually make all the difference. Um, the other things I would say really quickly is... So, so I was, I was going to say that um, painting that picture for the show is something we really see in successful applicants. So sometimes we see people paint the picture of all the lead artists, but they don't tell us because often it's a devised work. Mm -hmm. They don't often tell yeah. us the story of the show that we're funding. Rather, they'll just tell us how awesome these artists are. So, yeah, learning that, um, that yeah. language is great. I think that's a really big one because it, it sometimes looks like you're leaning on just the the reputation of those artists and what they've done before rather than being really expressive about what you're intending to do, like what this future work is. But I know that from a producer or a facilitator's perspective or whatever, sometimes we shy away from that because you get so trained into not speaking for the work before the work exists. But I think in an application you have to just be like you said, Alice, that you've just got to be bold. It's okay to say, here's what we're imagining. We're going to legitimately go through the process. Things are going to change, but this at least gives you the vibrancy of the work. Um, yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's a good segue into the artist involvement um, in terms of you can literally bring their voice into the application. You can put quotes, you can put key thoughts, and you can also put them in the support letters and the support material as well so that it's really clear that they are part of the experience, they're part of the project and they want to be in it and their voice is, is real. Um, and, yeah, I think that, like, for our project, we it was really dependent on our regional partnerships and we just realised that the first time around we just hadn't really amped up that voice. So we literally just prioritised adding in a regional um, partner's um, email rather than a, an, a formal letter so that we could show their legitimate voice and their interest in their own words in the project and what it meant to them. Um, um, the budget... That was, that was a massive for us as assessors, being able to see regional employment rather than just often we have um, metrocentric models of touring, which I sometimes push back against because I want to see yeah. regional artists getting work. I want to see small to medium artists involved in the work. So um, in the LEGS case of enjoy, employing a regional um, creative producer was a really strong part of the application and to see those, yeah, those support documents were really important to see those claims backed up as well. Yeah, I mean, that leads into what I was going to sort of say about the budget. And I know, Caroline, you're going to talk more about the budget, but it really is the honest story of the project. Like, you can talk really fancy and fluffy in your application and make all of these amazing promises, but your budget is just tells the honest story of that. And if they don't match, it's really obvious. So just make, have a look at it that they are telling the same story and compare them and make sure that they sit well with each other. Um, and also, um, I think another checkpoint is just, you know, in that way that if your budget's too low or too high, it's always, I find a really simple way of looking at it as if, if your company or you as an individual were paying for the project with your own money, because it's a really good way of going, oh my God, am I under-resourced or oh my God, am I inflating costs and, you know, spending money that is so hard won. Um, it's a really good checkpoint of trying to find that balance. And then, like you said, Alice, uh, an example for that specific second app was that we made sure that um, the community producers that had been identified were were re like were paid for, were earning fees, just the same as the you know the key artists or the city artists or whatever. So that there's this valuing community participants and valuing regional partners and regional artists as much as anyone that's involved in the project. Um. Absolutely. And I think uh, maybe that's a good point to go to Carolyn and talk a little bit about the budget and how the role that a budget plays. Um, from a create 
point of view in terms of the guidelines, we talk about um, viability being looked at by CREATE and then that's given to the Artform board members. But from an Artform board member perspective, the role of the budget is quite important. And I think Carolyn, you're really able to articulate that. Um, so we might go into budget. Yeah, great. Um, I think the budget is such an exciting place, as Cecily said, to tell your story and to support your story with very tangible evidence. Um, this is that third part of the, of the merit, impact and viability. And I think they tie in together really, really well. So we're assessing against merit and impact, but we're seeing how that is articulated in the execution of your project. And that's through the budget so it's an awesome opportunity to tell your story and we often see this unutilized so really use the note sections the very strong applications that we see use those note sections to articulate and demonstrate the story that's articulated in that purpose so if we think about the purpose of your application who you're targeting how you're getting there who's involved what are the metrics around um, your impact, whether it's art form or audience, um, how many people are involved, all that can be captured and told in the budget. We will talk a little bit later about key priority areas, but I also want to stress that the budget, again, is your opportunity to address how you're targeting those key priorities and how you're resourcing that appropriately. Um, we want to see things around what's confirmed, what you feel the level of risk or confidence is in those numbers, and what will you do if that's not achieved or, or it goes differently to how you expected. And you can use those note sections to do that. So for a couple of examples, in the income section, in the funding, so you can you can articulate other areas of funding. We you know it's great and helpful to see what stages of negotiation you're in when you might find out, how will you fill the gap if you're not successful? Will you scale the project differently or is there other opportunities to meet that funding need? Mm. A bit of evidence around the formula around um, something, for example, like box office expectations is really helpful. Um, so you've put a number in there. What is your assumptions that have led you to that number? In-kind support, really great opportunity to quantify venue support, people's time, sponsorship, pro bono services, um, and explain it and tell us, you know, what's it for, how is it confirmed, um, and how you will adjust again if it doesn't come through. For other re revenue, particularly for organisations, showing that diverse revenue mix is really helpful. It shows that sustainability and, again, that viability that we're looking for. We want to see that you'll be able to deliver the project. Um, for example, if you put in things in other income like sundry income and you put a figure in there but we don't have any details, that's sort of a missed opportunity to really highlight to us what, what this project is and how it might leverage or um, provide other opportunities for funding for future sustainability. And then if I go into expenses, this is a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate your financial discipline around the project or the organisation. So we want to see how you're going to manage that expenditure and, and list it out and give us that detail. So, for example, if it's artists, creatives or production or technical roles, does the cost here support appropriate wages? Um, this is an opportunity to reinforce, again, how many people are going to be employed in the project and for how long. Um, tell us how you've got to some of these numbers. Um, it's helpful, obviously, and important to relate the in-kind support to the expenses really clearly. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, this is your opportunity to demonstrate specifically how you're addressing the key priority, any key priority areas that you've indicated. Is there budgeting there for cultural consultation, community group advisory, accessibility costs such as online interpretation or training? Um, so hopefully that's a few examples. Um, I, I will leave it there and then we can come back to any questions if anyone wants specifics on. So I hope that's helpful. Totally. And I think maybe, Cecily, in terms of Legs's budget, how do you develop the costings for a project or how do you think about that? Um, that is such a good question. It's 
Look, every project is so different. I think it's just looking at the fundamentals. It is a bit it is a bit about, you know, the staging out of the project as well, like the two are so intertwined. Um, it's identifying just what you're looking to achieve, how big the project is in terms of the number of artists or the number of community involved and what kind of compliance that then needs, you know, like um, um, both of yeah, like we've already talked about that in terms of if you've got processes that include community or regional artists and there's travel and there's engagement and there's all kinds of that activity involved, then you have to be realistic about a, a project that effectively goes, you know, potentially in a longer timeline or has more stages involved. And then it's just being really legitimate about, you know, um, the fees that you, you know, and being consistent about it in terms of, the artist fees, the community remuneration, and um, and I think also don't be afraid. Like we, I often draft out a budget and step away from it and refine it a few times. Like that's that's just the reality. Look at what feels realistic, and like I said before, look at it with that eye of am I under resourcing myself and I'm going to kill myself, or I'm expecting too much from people for too little. Um, or is there some fat there that we can bring into contingency and pull it down so that it is a viable project and it is going to get support? And another thing you said, Brianna, about, um, you know, just being really clear about where a project sits if it doesn't get this one source of funding, whether that means you have to be hard and fast about saying, okay, well, the project can't go ahead until it gets this certain amount of resource, or you go, okay, it's really viable for us to do this part of it. And then we'll try and, you know, finance or resource the next. Yeah. And I think that kind of leads to this idea of how does the board see staging out a project? Um, do you see that as a positive thing that you as a board support? Um, and what do you want to see in those project stages? And maybe, Alice, I'll start with you um, on that. I suppose as a board, we're also really realistic about there's a range of artists applying. So from um, independent artists to small to companies like Legs and the, the applications are assessed slightly differently when we think of what support material, all of the things, what timelines different companies or individuals have capacity for. So I think it's really worth acknowledging um, that. So as a board, in terms of staging things out, sometimes we see projects that maybe are too big and should have been broken up into smaller chunks. Um, maybe you haven't benchmarked your ask against other successful um, applicants in the similar round previously. Like what, look at a $25,000 range, what someone else got for that. So you might have asked for 60, that might be out of um, whack for the scale of project. Also at a board level, we really notice, like Carolyn said, with the budget, we really notice if the budget's unrealistic. If you're not paying artists enough or if you're paying too much, we really do see that um, quite clearly. So yeah, I really encourage people to think about um, the staging, the timeline, um, and those timelines need to then match that budget. Um, and some projects obviously need more time if you're working in community areas, community, or in some of those um, key priority areas, you may need more time often or more budget, and you need to be paying people um, properly in those areas as well. Totally. And Seth, how do you decide what the stages will be of a project? It's such a good question because for us creative development is kind of a magical thing in that it can actually still include legitimately process so that is maybe research and development or community engagement. So um, that can be a bit of a broad umbrella for us creative development but within that each project really has that quite specifically defined just in terms of what that project demands. So. Lazy Susan has creative development really differently defined to say um, a new project coming up for us called Thor that is really only three artists and a creator and is a much smaller activity. It's much more epic in terms of physically what they're undertaking. But as you can see, it's a totally different project in terms of what creative development is defined by. With Lazy Susan, there's a whole lot of investment in process with community identifying partners going out to regional centre, doing research and development live one-on-one, -on -one, going into family homes and so on, and having that process supported, and then having an outcome for that, which isn't necessarily kind of a high art performative outcome, but speaks to that kind of combined creative development, research and engagement process. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so hopefully that answered your question. I think it does. I could just add another comment to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, we want to see that it's achievable. And so that might be, again, stepping back from the broader project and going, what's achievable for this timeline and, and this element? Um, and certainly signalling what may come next, um, but having an achievable scope to the project is really, um, really helpful. Yeah, that's um, a really good one. Amazing. Yeah. And I know, David, you've got to go, but I will ask your question at the end. But whilst I've got you, Carolyn, I might ask Paulina's question, which is on sunk costs, um, such as items for which they have spent money on how do you um, deal with the context or how do you explain those in the budget? Um, mm -hmm. How would those how would you like to see them appear and Carolyn I'll probably put this one to you yeah sure I think um do look at the eligibility because I know that for the funding um it, it's not eligible to fund things that have already happened prior to the to the funding round so do just check that with sunk costs however it might be um possibly I'm thinking things like um costs or expenses around things that have been developed so then that might become in-kind support because it's contributing from work or development or IP potentially. Um, yeah I hope that's helpful. I'll have a bit more of a think for some costs, yeah. And in terms of putting a really strong application together, what is the role that support material plays and how do you do it? And maybe Alice, I'll start with you on this one. Yes, so support material for me is massive. Also as a regional assessor, I'm just not there in the city seeing the same work that um, some of my other board counterparts are. Um, so, and I know it's really obvious, but really checking those times. So we don't wanna see a 20 minute video attached. And in fact, it's really hard to assess those ones because we're looking at three links, we're looking at multiple applications, we've given ourselves a time limit to look at your support material. Um, also, bearing in mind that in terms of your budget, how much you can invest into support material. But I'd say that the support material is really, along with your words, what sells your vision to us and is so important. So um, I also really wanna see that support material back in, um, uh, relating to your, um, the things you've said, your promises that you've made to us. I really wanna see those um, letters of support matching um, those asks in your budget, all of those things. Also matching the key priority areas. We really wanna see those letters reflecting accurately, not just saying you're a great company or the work's fantastic. We wanna see the numbers. We wanna see the people's names, how many weeks, what they're doing. So we really wanna see those, um, your, your claims backed up. And how do you put support material together, Cecily? Well, I just think, I mean, the thing I was going to say most of all is that actually support material can be a bit painful because you're often chasing people and it's something that sometimes can come down to the line because they're really busy and you're saying, I'm so sorry to ask yet again for the letter that I've been hustling you about. But even though it can be painful, um, tried and tested, I would say you tackle support material first and you just go at it deep and hard first because it is it is the voice of the project and it is like the budget it's honest about who's invested in the work and how real that is and and i just i get bored of reading support letters and so i think it's okay to embrace being a bit lateral about support material like like alice said she's not there to see the amazing shows that you've done and so don't be afraid to just jam in as much vibrancy as you can but equally in terms of your partners or your participants like especially with, you know, potentially regional communities or whatever that, you know, they're not always going to sit down and write a formal letter. It's okay to have, you know, a video chat with them where you talk about the kind of core interesting points about the project or you include a storyboard or something where you really are articulating kind of the soul of this work, but it doesn't all have to be in kind of formal letters. Karen, what do you look for in support material? Yeah, I really find that's the opportunity to kind of get the spirit of the project um, 
and so that could be through who the partners are or who the who the artists are. Um, some strong applications are just um, the artist talking directly to the camera in a sh super short video um, can be really great. Or some examples, if it is a project that's been in development and is now looking for presentation outcomes, showing some snippets of that that sort of in studio rehearsal, um, short and sharp, as, as Alice said, it is great. So we love to see that spirit come through. Amazing, thank you. Um, you've all mentioned it, particularly in terms of budget, but the questions of key priority areas and how you address them, but also I think the first question should be, um, what is the impact of these areas and what are you looking for in an application? And maybe I'll start with you, Alice, on this, particularly from a regional and young people's perspective. So um, my number one advice is kind of don't address them all if it's not authentic to your work. So much we see people ticking all five and then they don't have genuine partnerships in those areas. So they're, they're not backing them up. Um, so yeah, make sure it really resonates to your work. Um, so for a regional engagement, like I've mentioned with Cecily's work, we want to see local um, artists employed, regional artists employed. We really want to, I personally don't always want to see the experts from the city um, coming into the regional area, presenting a work for an hour, one workshop, and then leaving. I want to know that you're connecting with the RADO in the area. I want to know what your follow up is in 12 months time. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in that deep regional engagement. Also working with young people really, um, we as a board also realise that you are often devising work with young people. You're not necessarily bringing a play in that's already structured, but we want to hear from those artists. And that can be exactly like Carolyn said in support material. We can hear from your young artists what it's like to be an artist in your company or the theme of the work you're going to be devising. Um, and speaking directly to us, it doesn't have to have high budget. It can be shot on your iPhone. So it's that artist voice that we want in the same. It doesn't have to be glossy shots of in theatre shows. We want to know what it's like to work both with young people and in regional and communities and across these a lot of these priority areas. Um, we really want to see that relate to your merit and your vision um, and that impact. This really backs up your impact. Uh, yeah, that's from those two. Does anyone else want to answer for some of the others? Yeah, I think for me, you, we, we, we assume projects are inclusive, so ticking the priority areas isn't about inclusivity, it's about that very genuine, um, uh, authentic relationship to that key priority area, whether it's young people, people from culturally or linguistically diverse backgrounds, it's, it's so, um, it, don't, don't worry if you don't tick them all that we're perceiving that as not being inclusive. We, we know that works and our practice and our art form is about inclusivity. This is about where there's a very genuine priority in the project relating to one of those groups. And I think that's important to note also that Create New South Wales, we have, um, particularly for working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. We have an Indigenous protocols document that we require um, applicants to adhere to. Um, also in understanding the importance of IP, uh, particularly around um, First Nations communities. And we do want to be able to see that there is an understanding and that um, community leadership and self-determination is also present within the projects um, across all the priority areas because that is part of um, creates a commitment to these areas as well and just to really quickly summarize them and I hope I don't forget any Create New South Wales priority areas are um, New South Wales, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people living in Western Sydney, people living in regional New South Wales, artists with disability, young people and artists from uh, culturally and linguistically um, diverse backgrounds. And again, to probably reiterate what Carolyn said, and this all the art form boards actually say, is don't tick them if you're not actually delivering in this area because overall for an application it's really about 
um, creating the least amount of questions from the art form board um, in the application that you're submitting rather than creating more. Hmm. Which and, and we, we know that audiences may come from all those different groups and that you would be being accessible, but what would be looking for in an application which is around working with um, or, or, or projects that prioritise people with a disability is that it's, it's led by artists with a disability or it's specifically for participants with a disability. Um, yeah, so really finding that genuine connection and then backing that up with your support evidence and your budget. Exactly. Um, and so, Cecily, you mentioned this earlier as well, but I think in these times, and I know that sounds a little bit cliched, but we're all um, highly in tune with what's happening in the world and the impact that's having on us. And that often means that our resilience is being used in different ways. Um, so we don't have a lot left. So what are the mechanisms that applicants can employ in terms of dealing with rejection as well? Um, and I might put this to you first, Cecily, and then go to Carolyn and Alice. Yes, well, like just marshmallows hidden under the desk when you read that <laughs> now on a Friday afternoon. You always get rejection emails on a Friday afternoon just to ruin your weekend. But um, no, that's a lie. I don't have marshmallows under the desk. I, uh, look, I think that it's it really is about not taking it personally. It's really being able to distance you from that particular application, not getting it because Half the time the assessors want to give a whole lot more of you the bloody support and they haven't been able to. So they've had to look at the, the, the smallest weaknesses to discount you. And I've heard that time and time again. So I think it's, it's actually just looking at it from that, let's just be bloody pra pragmatic and be a dog with a bone and go, right, how do I address the things that are making this just miss out? And just don't let it get you down or even let it get you down and then get over it and then just bloody well apply again and just ring Brianna all the time. For <laughs> just hassle, just be a squeaky wheel because you get there. And I think fundamentally, you, like you were saying, Brianna, you've got to ask the question about what the kind of the broader global impact of the work you're trying to do is. You've got to ask yourself the hard questions. I do it with myself and we do it with our company and sometimes it's hard to answer that question when you have an emotional attachment to a project. But you've got to say, where is it sitting in the landscape? How urgent is it? How relevant is it? How is it going to read to someone who doesn't have the same emotional investment I do? Or you've got to find ways for them to be invested in the same way you are because of the combination of factors that you love about the project. The artists are amazing, the community is amazing, the time is now. If you are passionate about those things and you find a way to express it, you know, then it's going to be a strong application. Thanks, Seth. Carolyn? Yeah, I think don't take it personally. We want to fund so much more than we're able to. Um, but do, if, if you are rejected, um, re review the project, take some time back from it and then, and then come back to it, review, potentially go back to that purpose, consolidate that purpose, finding clarity in the purpose, why you're doing that. An mm. opportunity could be about looking at the staging. Is it about... Um, doing something on a smaller scale or breaking up the stages so that then there's there's evidence going into future funding rounds. Um, and again, I think articulating or, or reviewing your articulation of what's the current situation and how is this project, how is this work going to change or add or develop the art form in New South Wales? Thanks, Carolyn. Alice? I think the hardest words for me, both as an assessor and when you receive it, is unfunded excellence because that really acknowledging, like we've all said, there isn't necessarily the budget to go around. But if you can step back from your application and go, how do I go from getting a seven or an eight in a score to getting a 10 or a nine? Like what, what is going to make you make those small tweaks that will then take your application to that next level? Also being really realistic for your time. If you are an independent artist, the amount of time that you put into this application is really massive. Um, so starting early next time or getting mentorship 
really working out how to take that to the next level. Um, and again, I've said that benchmarking, but also looking at what the success rate is for the applications that you're applying for. I was really surprised in our conversation with Brianna to learn that those quick turnaround grants are only a 12% success rate. Yeah. Um, and then the board that we're sitting on is around 40 to 50%. So there's a higher success rate, but obviously there's a lot more work. So really looking across the board that all of the grants you're applying for mm -hmm. and what the success mm -hmm. rate is, who else is successful like you. Um, and really kind of not giving up. Um, I think one emerging artist in Melbourne that I first worked with, I remember them saying they submitted those 17 applications before they got to the 18th that was successful. Um, and yeah, just working out how to reflect on your own work to work out how to take it to the next level. And I think something important to sneak in actually as well, Bea, is is asking for help. Like talking about it saying, I'm really disappointed that I didn't get this. Can you read it and tell me what you think after the fact, you know, and learning then from that outside eye because sometimes you don't do that because you want to hide the application in a corner and never look at it ever again because you're so disheartened. But, you know, it's really valuable if you want to continue with, you know, try again and continue with that project and have it supported. Mm. Yeah, don't let the time be wasted. It's continuous development and improvement. So don't sort of, as you say, if it's rejected, put it away, never look at it again. There's lessons and learning in that which may help for future applications. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to address some of the questions now. Um, David, the first one's from you, and this is probably actually for CREATE, but you asked, there's a number of initiatives of late that support the arts on both a federal and state level, but they've tended to support the major organisations and be venue focused. In the next round, is there an increased pot for the small to medium? Um, so for the arts and cultural funding program that CREATE delivers, and I obviously can't talk for federal, um, we have um, a set budget which the minister announced um, at the beginning of this financial year, which has increased slightly, um, and that's support for projects of excellence. Um, one of the questions in this same vein that was asked online an event bright which was is there an allocated pool of funding for this board for this round and is there additional funding to previous years um, overall the whole budget for the acfp has been increased um, for this financial year there is not set amounts for art form boards for each rounds just so um, everyone knows it's about trying to support the best applicants possible so they don't um, set any budgets it's really about the caliber and quality um, of applications but as the board have mentioned here particularly with unfunded excellence um, unfortunately the budget does not always cover everyone that the board would like to support there was also a question um, how to demonstrate impact. This one came from the Eventbrite and I might go to you first, Carolyn, about what do you look for in the impact area of a grant application? Yeah, for impact for me, it's articulating who, who it might be. And that's um, numbers, super helpful. So how many artists, what's the audience opportunity, are there participants involved, administrators, you know, really kind of quantifying who, or um, is there operational impact? So again, looking at the current situation and how the funding might support to move you from that current situation to a future vision, um, or the art form impact. So. I think defining um, a gap or a problem and showing how this will deliver or extend or um, respond to um, is really helpful. I'll also say there was a previous webinar delivered by our colleagues, Olivia and Colm. Um, specifically, they focused a lot on merit and impact and I'd really encourage people to look at that as well if they want more information there. And we'll put that link um, in the chat and it's also on the Create New South Wales website. Alice, what do you look for um, in regards to the impact section? 
I really look at those numbers, yeah, again, telling the story and making sure they're genuine. And so, yeah, addressing those key priority areas, but also I really want to see, yeah, how many artists are engaged, what the work's doing, what it's doing for the sector. So we might see a work that's changing, that's challenging choreographically, or we haven't seen something um, before. So also pushing art forms um, and I also am really interested often in the practice. It doesn't, because we often work in community arts, it doesn't always have to be on the stage at the Opera House to be celebrated as excellence. Those impact really shows why your work is still of a high merit just because mm -hmm. it's not in our city centre being presented um, at that level. Amazing. And we've got another question from Hamish, which is in regards to board choice. Um, in terms of uh, producing a circus, physical theatre, performing art, print magazine, which board would that apply to? The literature board said it's the board that is, it enriches the most. Um, as that a magazine of that type would fit this board from a create perspective, you'd absolutely be eligible to ask the dance and physical theatre board to that, um, to support that type of magazine. Um, and Alice and Carolyn, would you both agree that a publication around your art form would be um, received uh, within the dance and physical theatre board? Yeah, I think so, um, particularly because it would be looking at um, supporting and um, developing the sector, and that's quite important. So anything around um, partnerships in the sector or deepening audience engagement across the sector, so I think there would be a fit there. Right. Yeah. And maybe, Alice, because the second part of the question is it's focused on regional New South Wales-based artists, in terms of the criteria it would fit the new work, um, what would you be wanting to see from anyone engaging regionally? I just want to see those really clear partnerships. So those letters of support um, backing up what the impact's going to be and also from those companies that that work may be with um, and those New South Wales artists that we might not know as a board, they're not necessarily applying to us currently. Um, so yeah, th those letters of partnership with that sector um, that may not be as visible to this board currently would really help. Also, Amazing. I think uh, like Hamish is a good example you know, potentially of artists that are also trying to diversify their, you know, what their practice is or what they're even able to make income from and just not shying away from that, talking about that kind of diversifying of skills. Yeah. And supporting Absolutely. artists in different ways, you know, that he's potentially employing artists to create the magazine, etc., as well as the impact it's having for the sector. Totally. And Liz asked a question in terms of financial reporting um, and having an organisation change from financial year to calendar year. So the audited statements are a bit different. We just asked for your previous audited statements. We understand that now some organisations still have not completed an audit. And so you just would use your 2019-20 audits um, and then project your figures from the 2020 to 2021 need, as need be, and that would appear in your budget. Um, also, um, David said, which boards? Because um, it's often challenging for artists to know which boards. Um, very quickly, Create always say it really is up to you, but often the boards, as you would know, Carolyn, um, and Alice may make a suggestion or recommendation if they feel like a work should move. Um, I think that's all of it. I might be ask very sneaky and ask our three amazing panelists just to give their one or two top tips on writing this grant. And I might start with you, Alice, in what would you like people to really take away from this session? Um, I think what you need to take away is really start early and back up your claims. So obviously you're a few days out from submitting it, but really thinking about those letters of support, making sure they're backing up what you're saying, using your unique voice, and I'm really excited to yeah read the applications. Carolyn? I might say on the theme of the budget, so use the budget to tell us 
your story, use the notes, um, show that evidence um, relating to the key priority areas and and all the quantifiable resource that goes into delivering the project, put it in there so we can see it. Thanks, and Cecily? Well, I can only speak from being an applicant, not a, an assessor, but I would say for me, um, don't forget the voice of the artists or the people that you're saying are leading the project, don't speak for them. Get feedback, do not leave it to the last second, and I know that better than anyone, but give yourself just enough time to have an outside eye to read over it. And um, be realistic about the money that you're asking for and, and what, how that relates to the impact of the work. It's true, submitting at 4.59 is always the most stressful moment, I think, in writing a grant. So try and avoid that if possible. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I say 4.59 because Create closes at 5 p.m., not midnight, and it's actually good to also remind everyone of that. Um, I would like to say thank you so much um, to our three incredible contributors and speakers today, Alice, Carolyn and Cecily. We really appreciate your time and effort um, and the generosity of knowledge and information that you've shared with everyone today. Thank you so much for that. If anyone does have any further questions or anything comes to you, please email or call CREATE. Um, our numbers and details are up there. Um, but for now, I'd like to say thank you and thank you everyone for attending and we hope this was very useful. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Um, thanks.